Hello and welcome to part 3 of the Anatomy and Physiology series for the Eurogenital System. Today we're going to be taking a more in-depth look at the Eurogenital System by having a look at females versus males with regards to the genitalia and the hormones, and we're also going to start to take a look at pregnancy, which will be continued in the next video where we look at birth as well. So to start with, we will look at the female genitalia and hormones. So with regards to the female internal genitalia, the erectile structures in women are called the bulbs of vestibule, and they're situated either side of the vagina. The erectile mass is the glans clitoris in the female, and it can be seen here on the diagram. With regards to external genitalia, the clitoris and vestibular apparatus, together with numerous skin and tissue folds, form the vulva. Either side of the midline, two thin skin folds, called the labia minora, are present, as you can see here. And these are surrounded by the labia majora, which are two thicker skin folds. With regards to the uterus, this is a thick muscular organ between the bladder and the rectum, which is lined with columnar epithelium. It leads to the cervix, which can be composed of three separate parts. The fundus, which is doomed superiorly at the top. The body, which is lateral and flattened. And the cervix itself, which sits at the bottom of the uterus, um, which projects into the vagina. The uterus can be described as antiverted and antiflexed on top of the bladder, and this can be seen when looking from a lateral view of the female genitalia. With regards to the vagina, this extends from the vulva to the uterus, so it's from the opening where the cervix is, and it's a muscular tube which extends towards the vulva exteriorly, externally. Angled upwards and backwards, with the cervix projecting into the anterior wall of the vagina, and it's lined with stratified, non-keratinized epithelium. There are also fornices, which can be felt with a manual examination, and these can be both lateral to the cervix. With regards to the cervix itself, it can be described as having an internal and an external os. The external os is the opening between the cervical canal and the vagina, and the internal os is the opening between the cervical canal and the main uterine cavity. With regards to this squamocolumnar junction, this is found at the external os, where the columnar cells of the uterus meet the stratified epithelium of the vagina. And therefore, because there's a change in um, cells here, there's an increased risk of metaplasia. With regards to the ligaments that are present, the broad ligament is made up of three parts. The mesometrium is the largest, and it extends from the lateral pelvic walls to the uterus. The mesosalpinx is the most superior part which suspends the uterine tube, and the mesovarium is the posterior extension that is attached to the ovary. There's also the round ligament of the ovary, and this is situated on the posterior wall of the broad ligament between the ovary and the junction between the uterine tubes and the uterus. Then you have the round ligament of the uterus, which is situated between the anterior wall of the broad ligament and through the deep and superficial rings to each labia majors. This is quite difficult to understand unless you can visualise it, and so what I'd recommend doing is having a look at a diagram online to try and visualise these ligaments. Next we'll take a look at the menstrual, or ovarian and uterine cycles, and it's really important that you don't get them mixed up. So first of all, let's take a look at the ovarian cycle. So this diagram here, although in a cartoon manner, nicely describes the differences between the ovarian and uterine cycle very clearly. So the uterine cycle is involved in the proliferative and secretory phase, and it's the changes in the thickness of the endometrium. Having said that, ovulation is, the, um, is all to do with the hormones that cause the release um, of the egg in terms of ovulation, where you have an LH surge in the middle, and is made up of a follicular and luteal phase. So let's, let's have a look, bit more of an in-depth look at the ovarian cycle, which can be seen here at the top. And it's made of three different phases, the follicular phase, ovulation, and the luteal phase. So the follicular phase is where the development of the follicle occurs, so day 1 to 14. And the FSH levels are fairly high during this time, so FSH is in blue. Ovulation is approximately day 14, and this is where we see a massive surge or massive spike in the level of luteinizing hormone, LH. We can also see a smaller peak in FSH during this time, but the main hormone inducing ovulation is LH. Finally, we have the luteal phase, and this is where menstruation would occur if pregnancy did not occur. So if the egg was not fertilized, therefore we would have menstruation between day 15 and day 28 of the ovarian cycle. Next we have the uterine cycle, and this is sometimes called the menstrual cycle. 
So the uterine cycle also has three stages. These are the proliferative and secretory phases, as well as menses or menstruation. So during the menstrual cycle, or the uterine cycle, the endometrium grows into a thick, blood vessel-rich tissue lining, which represents an optimal environment for the implantation of a blastocyst upon its arrival into the uterus from the fallopian tubes from the ovaries. The menstrual cycles are counted from the first day of menstrual bleeding, and are typically around 28 days long. So during menstruation, the body begins to prepare for ovulation again. And during this time, the levels of estrogen gradually rise, and they can be seen here in purple on this diagram. So this signals the start of the proliferative phase, during the gradual increase of estrogen here. Ovulation is triggered, as we've said before, by a surge in luteinizing hormone. Continuing on, we have after ovulation, so after the egg is released around day 14, under the influence of progesterone now, the endometrium changes to a secretory lining in preparation for a potential implantation of an embryo, should the egg be fertilised, to establish a pregnancy. So the, the best way to describe this is that the endometrium, the, the, lining of the, the inner lining of the uterus, is now well built up and ready to receive the egg, should it need to. If a blastocyst does implant within the endometrium, then the lining remains as the decidua. This becomes part of a placenta and provides support and protection for the embryo during gestation. However, if implantation does not occur within approximately two weeks, the progesterone producing corpus luteum in the ovary will recede, causing a sharp drop in levels of both progesterone and estrogen. This hormone decrease causes the uterus to shed its inner lining and the egg in menstruation, and the cessation of menstrual cycles at the end of a woman's reproductive period is termed the menopause. With regards to male genitalia and hormones, the testes are ellipsoid-shaped and enclosed in a muscular fascial pouch, which is continuous with the anterior abdominal wall. The spermatic cord is the tube-shaped connection between the pouch and the anterior abdominal wall, and each testes is composed of seminiferous tubules and interstitial fluid, so this is where the spermatozoa is produced, surrounded by a connective tissue capsule called the tunica albuginae. Anterior and lateral aspects of the testes are covered by a closed sac of peritoneum, called the tunica vaginalis. With regards to the testes, as we said before, spermatozoa are produced in 400 to 600 highly coiled seminiferous tubules, modified at the end to become straight chest tubules, then to the rate testes and eventually to the uh, vas deferens, where it will travel to the uh, urethra. Approximately 12 to 20 efferent ductules connect the rate testes with the epididymis, and sperm is stored in the epididymis until ejaculation. Sperm passes via the ductus or vas deferens into the ejaculatory duct and is excreted out of the penis. The penis itself is composed mainly of two corpora cavernosa and a single corpus spongiosum. And this differs from a female where there's just two corpora cavernosa and the corpus spongiosum in females is represented by a small amount of erectile tissue from the vestibular bulbs to the glands. So the male penis consists of a root and a body, and that can be seen in the bottom right diagram there. The penis itself is covered by skin, and the tip of the body is covered by the glans penis, and the external urethral orifice of the penis is sagittal slit at the tip of the glans. Normally there's a fold of skin at the neck of the glans, which is continuous anteriorly with a thick slit, um, tightly adhering to the glans, and this is called the prepuce or foreskin. The prepuce may be removed during a male circumcision, leaving the glans exposed. However, the natural state of the penis at birth is with the prepuce intact. This will not retract until around the age of seven. However, at the age of seven, this should start to retract to reveal the glans penis. So therefore, the retraction of the prepuce is physiologically normal to not retract until the age of seven. However, after seven, it should then retract, and it may be pathological called phimosis if it doesn't retract. Next we'll have a look at pregnancy. So we'll have a description first of all of what happens in each stage of pregnancy. So it's, pregnancy can be split into three different semesters, split by 12 weeks. So 12 weeks to 24 weeks to 36 roughly weeks. In semester one at around four weeks the brain and spinal cord have begun to form and the heart also begins to form and starts to beat. And therefore the heart starts to beat often before even the mother realises that she's pregnant in a lot of cases. At around eight weeks, all major organs and external body structures have begun to form, and the baby is a fetus and does actually look like a human. 
At 12 weeks, the nerves and muscles start to work together and the baby can make a fist. External sex organs are visible on a scan to identify as well, versus male versus female. The eyelids of the baby can close to protect their eyes as well, and they now stay closed until the 28th week. In semester 2, at around 16 weeks, all the muscle tissue and bone continue to form, and this creates a more complete skeleton. At around 20 weeks, the baby is more active, and hair, called lanugo, is formed. At 24 weeks, the bone marrow begins to make blood cells. And finally, just a little note on reproduction here, if a baby is male, the testicles begin to move from the abdomen into the scrotum. However, if a baby is a girl, the uterus and ovaries are in place, and the lifetime supply of eggs have formed already in the ovaries. By semester 3, at around 32 weeks, the bones are fully formed, but they're still soft. And by 36 weeks, the vernix coating around the baby is thick, and consequently the baby is moving less. In those final few weeks of pregnancy, at 37 to 40 weeks, the baby is full term and the organs are ready to function outside of the mother, and therefore labour should begin at any time after 37 weeks, but preferably before 40 weeks. With regards to amniotic fluid, this is formed initially from the maternal plasma. However, in later stages, when the kidneys are formed, it's formed from the fetal urine. Amniotic fluid can be measured on ultrasound scanning and therefore can indicate pathology if there's too much or too little. Normally, the fluid levels of amniotic fluid increase to a peak of around 800 millilitres at 28 weeks and then reduce again before the baby is born. If it's degreased, this can indicate intrauterine growth restriction, renal pathologies or ruptured membranes, and if it's increased, this can indicate diabetes, macrosomia or fetal pathologies. With regards to fetal movement, it's normal to see quickening of movements, normally noticed around 16 to 20 weeks, and when mothers feel a kick from the baby, this represents a large limb movement. Generally, it's thought to be quite a normal and reassuring feature from a mother's point of view, and often it acts in a diurnal rhythm, in other words, it's more active at night, and this is obviously the opposite to um, children and adults to fully grow. A reduction or loss of fetal movement has been suggested sometimes to be pathological, and rarely it can be due to an underlying syndrome such as hypotonia. Having said this, there is no effective test or pattern for abnormal behaviour of identifying this. In terms of normal fetal growth, it's linear until 20 weeks. Usually we can only guess the size based on ultrasound scanning, and even still this is only 40-50% to 50% accurate. We can also do symphysial fundal height, and this again is only 25-35% to 35% accurate. Small or large babies than the average for their gestational age may have associated pathology. So all this monitoring that we do during pregnancy is a case of monitoring to see if we can identify pathology early on so that we can correct it as soon as possible. In terms of some terminology to be aware of, if they're under 20 weeks, it's a gynecological term, and if pregnancy is lost, it's a miscarriage. Over 24 weeks, it may be a limit of viability, and if a pregnancy is therefore lost, it is a stillbirth. 20 weeks to 23 weeks and 6 days is a bit of a grey area, so really the key terminology is, is differentiating under 20 weeks and over 24 weeks. Some more terminology here, so preemie paris is the first time a mother has been pregnant. Multi paris is a subsequent pregnancy. Gravidity is the number of times a mother has been pregnant. And the parity is the number of pregnancies the mother has had beyond 20 weeks. But these don't really tell you the outcome of a pregnancy. So, for example, say we had gravity 3, parity 1. This could be the mother's third pregnancy. But she may have had one miscarriage previously and one delivery beyond 20 weeks. But we don't know if it was alive and well, the mode of delivery, or any complications. So it's a great way to identify if a mother has maybe had a child before. But it doesn't tell you all the information you need about a pregnancy. We can also estimate birth um, through a variety of different ways. We can do this through the last menstrual period crown rump length, which is done via ultrasound, timed coitus, or embryo transfer if it's an IVF baby, will allow us to predict the birth date. With regards to scans and appointments, there are several scans that the mother must attend during pregnancy, and during these we take the opportunity to provide monitoring and support for the parent. The first opportunity to do this is the booking appointment at around 10 to 14 weeks, where we can do risk stratification and offer screening tests, um, such as to identify infections and antibodies. And then we can do an anatomy scan at 18 to 21 weeks, which gives us the clearest view of the fetus. And organ organogenesis is complete at this time. And then we can recheck once more at 28 weeks. An anti-D is given if needed, and recheck antibodies and glucose tolerance test as well. 
So that's everything for this video. If you do have any questions, please feel free to get in touch. And if not, then please feel free to join us in the next video where we'll look at birth and histology of your genital system. Thank you for listening.